Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Financial Confessions. It is me, your host, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet, Chelsea Fagan. I'm also a person who loves talking about money and everything that it touches. And one of the topics that comes up quite a lot on our channel because it is such a powerful use of our consumer decision making is how we dress ourselves. Now, there's a lot that goes into beauty and style beyond just the fashion aspect, but that is a huge focus for where especially women are going to be directing a lot of their discretionary funds. We've talked a lot on the channel about things like fast fashion and how much the normalization of consuming in that regard has changed the way we spend and changed the world that we live Live in. We used to buy and own very, very few items of clothing as a rule, and now we have almost as many new pieces of clothing as there are weeks in the year on average. This is not normal. This is not how things have always been. And especially when it comes to the financial and environmental impact, this is not the way things always have to be. Similarly, the way we spend on beauty has been severely warped by things like social media, how we view ourselves, how we view others. And especially as women, which most of you watching and listening are, it's important to remember that these spending decisions and all of their implications don't exist in a vacuum. It's okay to have problematic faves, to spend on things that might be objectively somewhat frivolous, or to invest heavily in things that might even be ephemeral. But it's important that we understand why we're doing these things, that we're not spending blindly, and especially not spending blindly in a way that is going to be harmful to our personal finances or the world around us. There are many people who are making more thoughtful and informed commentary on these subjects than I am, and I'm very, very grateful to have one of my favorites, one of the TFD office's favorites, in the studio with me today. She is a YouTuber, a video essayist, someone who speaks really thoughtfully on the topics of fashion and beauty and culture and media. She's also a fellow New Yorker and a fellow former Marylander, which I don't run into every day. And she's sitting right next to me. Welcome, Manalei, to the channel. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. <laughs> and before we get started, I want to thank HelloFresh for supporting this episode of The Financial Confessions. Go to HelloFresh.com slash TFC16 and use code TFC16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. And I also want to thank ShipStation for supporting this episode of The Financial Confessions. If you're a small business owner and want to save time and money while shipping your products, try ShipStation. With ShipStation, your small business can now access the same rates usually reserved for Fortune 500 companies without the contracts or commitments. Use my offer code TFC to get a 60-day free trial. Make ship happen. Do you have like a theme that you feel encompasses your personal style? That's so hard because I don't like to limit myself either. And I think that's another plague of our times where people just want to box themselves into these like little aesthetics. And anytime they come across a new aesthetic they like, they just like upheave like their entire wardrobe and, you know, just like find something <clears throat> new. Um, so for me, like I do have a lot of stuff that I don't think uh, coincides with my normal day-to-day -day look. Like I have a lot of just like random 80s paraphernalia and I, I don't usually dress like 80s like, but I like having that option because I do treat my clothes kind of like a costume, a costume layer. <laughs> and I like to have fun with it. So I don't know, currently I would say that I do include a lot of pearls and a lot of um, romantic uh, historical inspired silhouettes. Um, Simone Rocha is basically everything that I aspire to be. I don't know this person. I'm gonna have to Google. Uh, oh my gosh, you're killing me. They, uh, Simone Rocha is a brand. Um, oh, oh my god. <laughs> I'm like zero for five on this episode. I mean, she's a person. She's a person too. It's like okay. Coco, Coco Chanel is like a brand and a person. Okay. But, uh, yeah, she's like a designer that I, I really look up to, but I, I can't afford like anything. Um, Got it. But, you know, inspiration board. <laughs> Mine is Eileen Fisher. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> sort of. Um, how do you decide the topics that you're going to speak about, um, particularly as it pertains to the more pop culture stuff? I think I'm just genuinely interested in media culture and like social ramifications. Like I didn't really decide to take that angle when I first started doing these YouTube videos, but then it kind of just like ended up being the angle I took when I was writing out the scripts and everything. But um, one of the major issues that I've always had with like the fashion sphere is that I find it's very 
exclusive and it's very white and there's not a lot of discourse about like colonial roots for instance or like cultural appropriation in the space and those are all things that I've always had an interest in so I think it's like by nature of exploring a lot of these topics you kind of just end up going down this like socio-cultural route regardless you know whether or not you want to (laughs) do you feel so some of the other youtubers that i'll occasionally watch in the space i think fit a lot more into what you're describing as being a sort of exclusionary um Mm. sort of framework and i think in a lot of ways about upholding what has always been elitist about fashion and your videos to me often feel a lot more accessible and friendly I think in part because obviously your personal style is very playful and very unique and not you know I mean not like cool fashion girl style um in that regard do you feel ever a sense of you know anxiety about how the quote-unquote fashion people are going to take your work uh no (laughs) I mean, I I definitely do get like some kind of anxiety about where my trajectory is going, you know, like in the future. And I've been invited to a couple of fashion events and sometimes I'll go and I'm like, wow, I'm really like I don't belong here. And uh, I I'm definitely like comfortable with who I am nowadays that I try not to see myself not fitting in as like any particular crutch I think the fashion industry needs a lot more diversity and a lot more creative energy that comes from not just like nepotism babies (laughs) enough of them enough yeah so I don't know like people will just say whatever they want about my style and I think I've been experimental for a long time I think I started really like stepping outside of my box um even in high school when all my all my classmates were wearing like Lululemon and Uggs, like I never had I never had any of that. So I'm just used to getting comments about my style and it's become something that I don't really care about anymore as long as it's like it's fulfilling to me. Well, we're fans here. <laughs> um, uh, so you did a video, I want to say pretty recently, um, about TikTok and fashion and how it specifically kind of creates this, because obviously, as I mentioned in the intro, fast fashion in general as an industry has created a level of hyper-consumption that's pretty unprecedented um, in human history. And social media apps, particularly ones like TikTok, can I think really heighten that um, that sort of normalization of overconsumption. Obviously, on YouTube, we've talked a lot about things like haul videos and whatnot. Um, but in the video, you really kind of dive into um, the relationship between brands like Sh- Sh- Sheen, she she in she in oh my gosh brands like she in this is how knowledgeable i am you guys um and platforms like tiktok can you talk a little bit about that for those who may not have seen the video so i know it's she in because they actually used to be she inside um and they did like a little rebrand they used they used to be a drop shipping company oh okay um, back in like the 2010s can you define drop shipping for those who are listening I think in like the most basic terms I can say, it's like uh, factories in normally China, they'll create like a bunch of products and then other companies will just basically like buy the products from this factory and like sell it under their own label or like their own brand name. Um, But it is like fast fashion. So but going back to what you were saying about my video. I made that video because I was getting very annoyed by all like the TikTok hauls people were doing back. Uh, I don't know if they're still, I guess they're still doing them. I think now my For You page just knows I yes. don't want to see it anymore. Yes. So I haven't been exposed, but it's it's essentially when someone just shares um, like 20 pieces that they bought all at once in one video. And it's like bulk buying. And it's very unsustainable because it promotes consumerism and also because these fast fashion brands tend to sell their clothes very cheap it's a lot easier to bulk buy fast fashion clothes than like bulk buy sustainable clothes for instance 
<clears throat> there are a lot of brands, though, that I think, and we got some questions about this, are trading on a marketing perception of being more ethical, more sustainable, but often fall into the same practices. And I think a lot of our audience often feels lost as to how they can really suss out which products are more ethical, where it's worth really investing your money. Do you have a system you use for that? <sighs> I mean, my system is not necessarily like the most reasonable system for a lot of people because I just tend to buy vintage clothing or secondhand um, or clothes that are made by like one person on Instagram. I am very into just finding random dressmakers on Instagram and buying from them and I know it's just like one person who's doing everything from beginning to end. And I know that's not reasonable so my other alternative is there's an app called Good On You. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it, they, something. yeah, they're an amazing app. They basically do all the research for you about certain clothing brands and they will rate them on a scale. And I think they consider um, sustainability, uh, uh, animal cruelty, and also like the, the humane working conditions. And I think that's a good resource. They don't cover every single brand that's out there, but they have, most of the major ones um other than that i think it is really hard because of how prevalent greenwashing is these days and just because a company is doing well on like one factor for example the environment doesn't mean that they have the best labor conditions or i don't know if you heard about the whole everlane scandal that happened in 2020 no but i'm ready for those to go down. <laughs> well they were just union busting um and they fired a bunch of people or laid off a bunch of people who were um, trying to form a union. And so in that sense, it's like, no, this brand is not ethical either for doing that. There's just so many layers that go into it, unfortunately. And it's really hard to be on top of everything. And like, you know, news articles will always come out every year um, exposing a brand that you thought was <laughs> really good. And you're like, oh, my God, I bought all this all this stuff from them. And I was like, do I keep it now? Um, so I think it is very difficult. And the only way really is just to like limit overall consumption um, Buy from smaller brands. Usually larger corporations tend to be greedy. I take a look at Reformation. They're known for being more on the sustainable side. But can any brand really be that sustainable if they're pushing sales all the time? Because in a way, that is encouraging overconsumption. So, um, yeah, I just tend to buy like small, <laughs> buy less, uh, buy less new. And if you're really unsure, um, you can always email the brand. I think, however, a brand responds to emails about uh you know, ethics and sustainability shows a lot about who they are. If they give just vague answers, if they have like an about page, that's just extremely vague. Um, they're probably greenwashing because I think we definitely live in a time now where environmental um, impact is really important. Humane labor conditions are really important. So if a company is doing all those things correctly, they're going to want to market that right. they're going to want to share what they're doing. Um, generally, any company that has photos of like factories um, where you can see the workers actually working in like clean conditions, um, that's usually a good sign. So the more information that they put in their uh, web page, the better. And if they don't have anything, then it's kind of safe to assume that they're not they're not ethical. <laughs> what do you say to someone who feels like they are on the hamster wheel of overconsumption and have just gotten so used to doing their shopping through things like fast fashion i've been there <laughs> <laughs> like i i sympathize because the way that uh companies market to you it's really hard to pull yourself out of that cycle when you see there's like constant 50 percent off sales and constant trends that are coming in and then People on TikTok saying you look chuggy because you're still wearing something that is you that have in your closet. Is that how that's pronounced? Is that how that's pronounced? <laughs> Sorry, it's chuggy. Okay, I was been saying chuggy. No, okay. Oh my no. god. I'm gonna go take myself out back and, and put me out of my misery. Please continue. I apologize. Um, yeah. So I definitely can see why people want to buy, buy, buy. But um, the way that I've personally gone about it is. Um, one, I definitely feel less bad if I'm buying buying secondhand because I know these things were already produced. I'm not feeding into this like 
cycle where, you know, we're just producing new and we're passing it on to consumers and companies are measuring statistics and they're like, yeah, consumers are, bu-. like, you know, I'm not factoring into those metrics, I would like to think. And um, also I, <laughs> I limit myself to buying only one day of the week. Mm. And this is not something that I um, do like every week where I'm like, okay, I Friday's the day that I buy. I'm just going to log on and buy as much as possible today. But if I see something that I like and it's not Friday, which is my designated buying day, I'll wait till Friday. And if I still like it, then I'll buy it. If I, I'm like, uh, I've had a couple days to think about it. This is not actually something that I really want then I won't buy it. And I think having that amount of time to pause and actually think like, is this something that I'm going to value? That will kind of put a break on um, like spontaneous spending. And then also something that I always have tried to do is like if you can imagine yourself wearing this five different ways, then I think it's a good purchase. Because Mm. some people will just buy something and it's like, oh, it's like a statement piece or whatever, but then you just never wear it. Um, and that's not, that's not a good use, like either for your wallet and then also for the environment. That's very true. And I will say, I mean, as much as I've, you know, spoken my relative distaste for minimalism on this channel as a political concept, which it often (laughs) is, um, or like a social status marker, which it also often is, I do think that there is something for most people to be said about some kind of a capsule wardrobe in terms of, you know, making sure that the majority of your pieces are things that can be worn with other things. Because I do feel, at least for myself as someone who dresses pretty conservatively, um, it is usually the items that are most sort of like attention grabbing that I personally am like, well, I'll wear that once a year and then never, never otherwise. Whereas I'm sure you're sort of the reverse. Like I'm sure you don't have many like, you know, very basic items that you're putting on frequently. I do have, <laughs> you do? I just don't photograph myself wearing them, but I do have, um, I do have basic items that I wear pretty often. I do have a pair of yoga pants. Whoa. And- Um, But no, you're totally right. And I think the whole idea of the capsule wardrobe is great. I think what we think of a capsule wardrobe is bad because, you know, if your capsule wardrobe includes like something really bright and colorful and it's still something that you're willing to wear, like that's a capsule wardrobe. It doesn't have to be just like two white blouses and like a black dress. Right. Um, So, yeah, and also it's like you can buy a statement piece if it's something that you know you'll wear multiple times. Like if you're not someone who just wears it once to a party and never again, if it's something that you actually think is a staple in your closet, um, sure, go for it. But I think with our current consumerist patterns, that doesn't tend to be the case. Are you an inspiration boarder? I am an, I have a Pinterest, if that's what oh, you mean. <laughs> yes. We love to see it. Um, what do you typically put on there? Is it more individual pieces or what? It, what's on there? So my Pinterest is kind of like a cluster of all kinds of things. So I have my home decor Pinterest, uh, which doesn't even make sense because it's mostly like architecture. And I'm like, I can't actually decorate my house like this because I live in like a box of an apartment. Right. But, you know, it's, it's nice to – it's a fantasy mood board. Um, I have – For my fashion mood boards, they tend to be more like thematic. So I'll have a lot of runway um, pictures, like movie screenshots, even just like random costumes. I tend not to do like actual pieces Mm -hmm. for some reason, but I like to uh, use my mood boards more conceptually than like um, what's like literally. So we have the fashion part of it. now, not to put you on blast, but I'm looking at what I assume is your bag. I don't think that's Holly's. <laughs> it's a Prada bag. Vintage, secondhand? Secondhand, yes. Secondhand. From the 2000s. Where do you stand on your relationship to the hyper luxury of it all? Huh. So that's a difficult question because I think growing up, and I feel like this is the trajectory for a lot of people who love fashion since they were a child. You kind of idolize luxury brands because it's what you see plastered in all these magazines. It's what you know is like the the apex of fashion. Nowadays, you know, you have like all these like smaller designers um, that are paving their way. And I definitely wear a lot more smaller designers than I have luxury brands. I think all the luxury things I own which is not even a lot, are secondhand or vintage. 
And my opinion just on high fashion is that I think it is very nice. <laughs> like the quality tends to be very nice. Not always. I have seen a lot of polyester on the runway and I'm like, why would you spend $5,000 on polyester? But I digress. Um, a lot of them are very aesthetically interesting. I love haute couture always. I think that's like kind of, that is like the peak of design. In my opinion, it is like where art and fashion combine. So I have a lot of respect for a lot of the fashion houses, but I do think there is this misconception that just because something is luxury, it means it was ethically made. Mm. And that's not always the case. Like you hear of those stories of Burberry and how they burn a lot of their bags to keep the whole uh, exclusivity um, factor going when they can't sell all their bags. And that's not good. So I definitely think there is a line between, yeah, this is uh, this is like well-made, but also... Let's make sure that it's actually well made. I've always had, I've always found it so interesting the like very sort of household name luxury brands and their relationship to wealth and status. Like for me, when I think of what the very few really, really wealthy people in my life that are, okay, not my parents, like <laughs> no one's super close, but the people that I know well enough and up close enough to know what they buy, what they wear, et cetera. Probably the most common brands are things like Brunello Cuccinelli and like The Row maybe for women and like things like that. But they're often these brands that most people don't even really think of when they think of luxury brands. They're very, in many cases, understated. Like Brunello Cuccinelli, for example, like you buy like an ugly crew neck sweater that looks like it came from J. Crew and it was like three grand. Like it's like a very specific type of wealth. And I'm interested in how you sort of see um, the relationship to what is ultimately, you know, what we, what the average person thinks of as the highest level of personal style and what the actual ultra wealthy are wearing. I mean, you're totally right with the row. <laughs> Those are <laughs> egregious prices for what looks like very basic clothes. Um, props to Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen for that empire. But yeah, I, I don't remember exactly all the brands, but I do remember people talking about how Mark Zuckerberg has like $400 t-shirts that are so unassuming. Like I think to the average eye, you couldn't tell the difference between what he's wearing and like a Walmart t-shirt. But um, I did a video recently on the old money versus new money. How and did I see this one? <laughs> uh, excuse me, guys. I'll be back in 30 minutes. Anyway. Um, so I think that's kind of what you're talking about where it's like old money they tend to go for brands that are more understated and you won't necessarily know how much they're paying for their clothes whereas new money are people who are like influencers um or the kardashians you know they wear a lot of monogram stuff so things that we as a culture understand are worth a lot because we're seeing the monograms so gucci um, louis vuitton prada Birkin bags um those are like the those are what I think like most of us would see and we're like oh wealth but right. um there are tons of brands that are not monogrammed and are also very expensive what's your relationship to like a big logo like you see a Gucci belt what do you think of that uh <laughs> I'm not like I'm not like a hater I don't have like extreme um views on it I do think that when people uh, just go for the monograms and they don't really like care about styling otherwise, you know, like people who are like, oh, like this is fashion just because they wear like a Gucci belt. I think it's kind of like conflating what fashion really is or diluting what fashion really is. So I find I find that kind of annoying. Um, but otherwise, I'm just like, uh, it's just not my thing. I'm a hater. I'll say it. I'm a hater. I really, it's it's very interesting to me because I do think that there is something, you know, even the people that I think of, like, for example, the people that I know who are, who are very, very wealthy, they're actually not new money um, or old money, rather. They're not old money. Um, but I think that there's this very, very specific, and I think social media probably heightens it, right? Like this very specific relationship that we often have toward 
if we're going to spend money on something, it has to look like I spent money on it from as far away as possible. And I do think a lot of people, and the thing is that I, listen, it's not my taste to wear something like a Gucci belt and I wouldn't judge someone for spending their money on it. But I do think when we talk about like these decisions not being in a vacuum, it's worth interrogating why it is it is important to the point that it is worth, you know, inflating the price to that extent just so that other people will know that it's of a certain quality, you know? Right. I mean, do you feel, what would be sort of your advice to people who are maybe, you know, for example, they might feel an insecurity about their wardrobe or about, you know, looking a certain way in their professional environment, um, sort of learning to separate uh, something looking uh giving an an air of affluence with just the quality of it? I mean, I think we live in a society. <laughs> so, we do live in that society. Can't so say it is really hard, and I understand why people who would want to spend money to look rich because you get treated better if you have a lot of money. Um, I remember when I was uh, when I was in college and I went into this the off-white store. Um, please tell me you know what off-white is. Is that <laughs> the um, – did the designer of that recently die? Yes. Okay, yes. Virgil, yes. Abloh. Virgil Abloh. Yes. 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 Um, so off-white, it's a very expensive brand. And I would kind of go into the store because I had a crush on one of the salespeople. Hell yeah. <laughs> so, I, you know, I was just like, you know, walking in. But the way that they treated me was so bad Ooh. because – you know, they could tell I didn't have the money to be spending um, in that store. And I had a friend who actually conducted a social experiment because she was like, she's Chinese and uh, she does own a Gucci belt. And she walked into the store wearing her Gucci belt. She was on the phone talking in Mandarin to her mom. And she just like looked very rich. And all the salespeople were kind of like fawning over her, being like, oh, would you like to see our latest collections? Like, blah, blah, blah. And then after a couple months, she went in just looking the way that she does. No one came up to her. Like, no one wanted to help her or anything. So to say that you're treated better if you look rich, like, I think that's so true. And I can see why someone wants to show that they're wealthy um, because they want to be treated better. And I don't think that's like a, a slight on anyone who's participating in that, but it is just kind of like an unfairness in our society. What was the question again? I got off topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that anecdote uh, definitely illustrates it. But, you know, for people who are, you know, again, maybe they're in a professional environment where looking a certain way is really important, or maybe they have insecurities about, you know, presenting themselves a certain way, sort of learning to separate uh your image from the image of wealth that you might be projecting to others? I think it's like a lot of practice because you may just have to wear certain clothes um, in your profession. You know, like I'm not someone who I think would ever go for a business attire, but if I was working an office job, I would do that because I want the respect that wearing that kind of clothing commands. Um, so I think it's just a lot of introspection at the end of the day, your personal relationship with your own worth and the clothes that you have and knowing like the clothes don't necessarily make the man. <laughs> no, they don't. Can we talk on that note about the importance of tailoring? Okay, tailoring is something that I became obsessed with once I started making more money <laughs> because I never realized how expensive tailoring can be mm. uh, as someone who grew up at home and my mom tailored all my clothes for free because <laughs> she my mom too she, yeah it's a lost skill I've tried learning how to sew since then and I think the best I can do is just hemming things mm -hmm. um but tailoring I think is so so important because it's it makes clothes look more expensive for one because we live in a society that prioritizes <laughs> I'm just like it's taking true. a dump on society. But like brands use like the the 246 if we're lucky. If not, they'll just use the SML or the one size fits all. And these uh, size measurements don't actually reflect uh, human sizes most of the times. So, you know, if you buy a pair of jeans that are like size, like waist 
I don't know, 30, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to fit you properly because it only takes in a certain measure of like your waist and you could have different waist to butt ratio, waist to butt to thigh ratio. Um, producers don't really care about these sorts of things. So they don't, they don't care about making sure clothes will fit you perfectly. They just care what clothes will fit like an average person who resembles you. Um, so I think tailoring can one definitely build the confidence of people who are struggling with finding clothes that really fit them well because I think uh, feeling good in the clothes that you wear is such a such an important part of like um, having a positive self image of yourself and kind of walking through society in a confident way and then also like tailoring and mending clothes is just super sustainable like I've definitely uh been at different sizes throughout my life like not dramatically but enough where I'm like oh like this this outfit like this this skirt no longer fits me like what am I gonna do right and uh if if you bring it to a tailor or if you know how to tailor things yourself it's like you can give new life to these garments that you no longer fit in it's very true. And I will say on that note, one of the – I'm very big on all of that stuff myself, and I will say it, it can be expensive, although much less expensive than constantly having to replace clothing um, that, do, that doesn't fit for you or, like, you feel terrible in, what have you. Um, and I do think that it plays a huge role in the overconsumption part of it is that, like, we're getting these things that look good maybe on the internet model that's been Photoshopped but not on a human body. Oh, my God. I Have you ever seen, like, those, like – viral tweets about people's yes. like boohoo or um pretty little thing <laughs> reviews where it's like on the model it's so different from what it comes to them and they like try it on it's so I mean I feel so bad for these people but it's so funny. well it's literally in many cases not even on the model it's like yes, literally it's photoshopped, photoshopped on onto the model them. that's not even an exaggeration but another thing that a lot of people don't know or I didn't know at least the tailors can do that I've done a couple times is if you find it it has to be a relatively simple piece depending on the person but uh, if you find a piece you really love, like a very simple skirt that fits you really well, you can take it and they will make that skirt for you in another fabric. Yeah. So like you can actually, because like a lot of times there's just like, I'm a big, like this, have it in four colors. Like if I like <laughs> it, I buy it in multiple colors, sometimes even multiple of the same color. But if there aren't that many options, you can get a tailor to make pieces that fit you really well. And this is like a lost, like, I don't know. Okay, obviously like people still do it, but a lot of people don't know that, which I think is so crazy because that's how clothes were made for much of the like the 19th, 20th century. Like people would take fabric into a tailor and be like, "I would like it in this pattern," and they would make you the dress. And I think that's really great. Um that's why I've been I've been reaching out to a couple dressmakers recently because I'll have an idea of what I like and I just like want someone else to fulfill the vision for me, someone with the skill set that I don't have. And I had a Regency dress made for me custom by one of my friends recently and it's in the style of Kira Knightley's Pride and Prejudice um, dress. Oh my god! That I, I've always loved like as a kid. I was like that's my dream dress and I had it made and I was like wow, I can't believe – I went through this much of my life not knowing that I could get this done. Like, I always thought I had to be the one to make it myself if I ever wanted this dress. Did you wear it to the Bridgerton experience? Yes, I did. How much did you pay for the dress? Would you mind sharing? I paid, I believe, 950 I mean, Which, listen, not a cheap dress, but I mean, probably not that different from what you would pay if you got it made from like a very, very high quality producer. Yes. And it was very high quality. It was tailored to me exactly like she sent me multiple mock-ups that I got to keep. And also it was one person doing all of it. Her name is Emma and I fully support her business. And I feel really good knowing that all the money like went to her and her um, dressmaking Trust making hobby. If you'll share her link with us, we'll put it in the description. Yes, and I, I will. <laughs> I will say my husband is, he's like a little hard to fit because he's 6'4 and very thin. Um, so he gets all of his stuff like tailored and then redone. Like he had his favorite wool coat. Uh, he had the um, the in, the in lining of it to completely mm -hmm. redone, which is quite a, an undertaking. Um, but he has such a like nice relationship with his tailor. She calls him the handsome man. <laughs> I'm sure she says that to everyone. 
So if you've been following TFD for any amount of time, you'll know how many of us love to cook and many of us on the team use HelloFresh. Whether you're an avid home cook or someone who is learning their way around the kitchen, HelloFresh makes cooking at home both easy and enjoyable. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. So go to HelloFresh.com slash TFC16 and use code TFC16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. One reason many people never bother to venture into cooking is because of the time and effort that it takes. We've talked before on the channel about how if you're someone who is getting into cooking and learning the basics and a little overwhelmed by all the possibilities, meal kit services like HelloFresh can be an amazing way to get into the process of home cooking without feeling like you have no idea what you're doing. Ordering is convenient, but it gets expensive, and enjoying food that you cooked yourself is always more satisfying. So HelloFresh is all about convenience. Not only do the ingredients come pre-portioned so you're not overbuying or wasting food, but their meals don't take a lot of time to prep. Get farm fresh seasonal produce and easy to make recipes delivered right to your door every week. Pick your favorites from 50 different weekly options and skip weeks when you need to. Change your delivery date or update your preferences in the HelloFresh app. You can also customize your favorite dishes with their new Hello Custom offerings by swapping out one protein or side for another, upgrading for a more luxe experience, or even adding protein to a veggie meal. That means more choices, more variety, and more meals tailored to you. TFD team member Holly just recently tried out HelloFresh's One Pan Santa Fe Pork Tacos, which took less than 20 minutes to make, had minimal cleanup, and tasted even better than her favorite takeout tacos for a fraction of the wait time and cost. So go to HelloFresh.com slash TFC16 and use code TFC16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. To be totally honest, one of the reasons here at TFD we've never ventured into selling tangible products online was because of the logistics involved. It's either too expensive, fulfillment is overwhelming, coordinating with shipping companies felt like a hassle, and it wasn't even something I had the energy to think about personally. But it's 2022, and as much as it's nice to shop in person, we've all defaulted to shopping online for one thing or another, and I know how valuable it is as a business owner. All of this is to say online shopping isn't slowing down anytime soon. Here at TFD, we were recently introduced to ShipStation, which is a company that is trusted by over 100,000 e-commerce sellers and learned that they take the headache out of every aspect of selling products online. They keep track of the orders for you, help you easily find the best shipping carrier with deeply discounted rates, and automate just about any shipping task with just a few clicks. As a small business owner, outsourcing tasks that relieve you of the mental load involved in any task is incredibly valuable. And as you all know here at TFD, we're all about saving money and spending in the smartest way possible. And with ShipStation, your small business can access the same discounted rates usually reserved for Fortune 500 companies without the contracts or the commitments. ShipStation works with every carrier, so you can always find the best fit for you. Ship more in less time with ShipStation. Use my offer code TFC to get a 60-day free trial. That's two months free of no-hassle, stress-free shipping. Just go to ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page, and type in TFC. ShipStation. Make ship happen. So beyond fashion, another topic that you do cover a fair amount on your channel um, is beauty. And recently you did a video about cosmetic procedures. Um, Can you talk a little bit about that video for those who might not have seen it? I talk about cosmetic procedures because I've noticed there is a bit of an epidemic lately um, of people going in to get work done and it's not just like a rhinoplasty um a lot of it is very subtle like fillers botox and i just kind of wanted to unpack uh that phenomenon and talk about how society uh pressures people to get that done nowadays and yeah i I don't know there's a lot i have i have a problem summarizing my thoughts in that way um have you had any cosmetic procedures that you would be willing to disclose I have not had any, Um, not because I'm against them personally, but uh, I also have a very complicated relationship with body image in that like, yes, like I understand these procedures, like they would make me feel better about myself. And I definitely feel like there is that pressure because I'm in, I guess, in some ways in the entertainment industry where a lot of people I know get them done. But on the other hand, like I also do want to cultivate a positive relationship with my own natural features. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, like I think getting cosmetic procedures would be in conflict with that. I feel you. I I have similar thoughts. I've had um, laser Botox um, in my jaw and that's basically it. But I'm coming back for more Dr. Green, so buckle up. (laughs) Um, 
But I mean, I feel similar to you in that, like, for example, growing up, like I always wanted a rhinoplasty. Like I was like, I went to a high school where like a lot of girls would get them. You know, it was very common in my town, like very normalized. And I think there was like a two year period for sure where like if I had had the money, I would have for sure gotten my nose done. It's hard to feel like this might not be regretted in a while, a lot of these procedures. Yeah, I definitely have also thought about that. I think that's also why I haven't gotten a tattoo. Because I'm like, oh no, like am I going to like this in 10 years? And no, you're totally right. Um, Unfortunately, we don't really know what will happen, like what people will look like in 20 years time, all these people who got BBLs. And speaking of BBLs, that is also a very dangerous procedure. And I think um, there are certain procedures that are – pretty safe like I think Botox is pretty safe I don't know Dr. Green weigh in (laughs) (laughs) listen I mean I think Botox we have enough data that I mean I certainly feel fine getting it and also the thing about Botox as opposed to like fillers like Botox dissipates over the course of like six months roughly um whereas like fillers are there forever and like when people start not to derail but like the stuff that I think is most worrisome is the stuff that doesn't go away but continue um So, yeah, I think there's definitely, like, a certain, like, ranking of (laughs) procedures that are, like, more dangerous to, like, less dangerous. But I think what's also a problem is, like, the less dangerous procedures can be a gateway to getting, like, more and more complicated and dangerous procedures, which I find, like, very scary. Um, And also what's concerning is that body types have been trendy for most of human history. So... I've seen articles already about people lamenting the end of the slim, thick body type and that we're apparently moving on to, like, the skinny waif body type again. No. I know. And I I just, like, I can't imagine, like, all these women who got BBLs in the last two years and just, like, probably going through a crisis once the new body type has switched. And I just don't think that's healthy at all. Um, No, I don't think it is. And also, I mean, you know, fast fashion is a problematic industry, right? But like if you buy a $5 t-shirt and don't really think too much about where it came from, like that is, you know, the long-term ramifications, at least for you personally, are like relatively small. You can wake up tomorrow and make better consumer choices. But for a lot of these procedures that are increasingly marketing themselves as being like hyper financially accessible, uh, accessible, like you'll see like the, you know, Botox starting at $10 in the windows of some of these med spas. Like yeah. if there is ever a place not to skimp, it is on stuff that someone is injecting into your face. Yeah, it's actually scary. I did a dental <laughs> video and um, some people would go to Turkey to get veneers Veneers. but then I forget what the procedures actually called but they did not end up getting veneers and they got this other very like detrimental procedure like (gasps) crown what I don't know but when they showed photos of these people it was like they had shark teeth like little little shark teeth and so yeah I'm like do not skimp on any cosmetic procedure the problem is people will because there is this societal pressure to get these procedures done. And unfortunately, if you don't have enough money to go to like the best doctor in Beverly Hills, you're going to get it at whatever cost you can get it, which is, you know. Often have, not very not very high. I will say, though, that something that I think is really important to remember for people who are considering this stuff, like the, the veneers thing is a great example because I do feel like there's been a weird – I think it's somewhat tapering off, but there's been a weird – process over the past like 10 years where like a person gets over a certain level of famous and then one day they come back and they have completely different teeth like (laughs) and they all have the same crazy ass like blue white horse teeth in their mouth that look completely unsuited to their overall facial structure and like obviously those aren't their teeth like famously like if someone's on a reality show for a season and then they come back for like an all-stars or like you know for a return in later seasons we got a whole new teeth you know set of teeth going um but I think what people often don't understand in those kind of procedures is that when you make these one changes like it's not in a vacuum like everything else now is different in proportion to it you know and I do think that especially when you take the like social media filter aspect of it and the photoshop aspect of it it's no wonder that people get themselves on a hamster wheel because once you change one thing you sort of have to change other things no you're totally right I didn't even like think about that but you know your nose for instance such like a big part of your face and if you get a rhinoplasty like a different nose there might be something else that you're like oh like the I don't know my cheekbones are not 
well placed with this new nose or something. And I think that is really scary because you can become so addicted to plastic surgery and it's extremely, an extremely expensive addiction. Um, my mom used to be obsessed watching that TV show Botched. Oh my gosh. Ugh. I Harry Debro, what havoc will you wreak on this society? I could never watch it because I'm so squeamish about like surgery, but you would hear about people spending like hundreds of thousands of dollars like in their lifetime on plastic surgery and it's like the hole in my wallet. I I can't imagine like I was like literally debating with myself for so long about getting this Regency dress and just like imagining spending thousands of dollars all at once on a plastic surgery procedure. I just I can't. Well, listen, we'll put the Regency dress up on screen and we'll link it to you guys in the description. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm, I haven't seen it yet myself, but I'm sure already that it was well worth it. So one of the questions, we've gotten a lot of questions uh, from our audience. And one of the questions, uh, kind of an overarching theme is, you know, you do have, I think, a, a very smart sociopolitical angle to a lot of your videos. Um, but ultimately, fashion and beauty are fundamentally consumerist, um, you know, industries. How do you sort of balance, I guess, just like being a, a an ethical fashion girl under capitalism, basically? <laughs> it's definitely uh, not a balance I have yet to fully achieve. And I I can admit that because I think we're all imperfect in this in this capitalist society. I just try my best. Like I, I don't really do um, – again, I – the way that my career – is built like I think I have it easy and that I, I make YouTube videos and YouTube only requires you to make like I don't know one video a week to stay relevant whereas I think a lot of TikTokers and Instagrammers f- like fall into this path where it's like I have to post new photos I have to post a new video every single day um, and if you're in the fashion realm that usually means oh I have to buy more clothes so that I have new content whereas I don't I don't really fall into that um but I, I don't know, like, again, like, I try to just buy vintage. I try to buy secondhand. I try to limit days that I buy. I try to look into all the companies that I buy from. I try not to promote anything that I'm not fully supportive of. Like, I, I tend to, I, if I, um, I don't think I've ever worked with a fashion brand. And that's because usually the brands that reach out to me are fast fashion. And I'm like, no, I, I don't, Good I don't you. promote that because I don't, you know, I don't support it ethically. So I just try to keep in line with my own ethics. But um, yeah, <laughs> I like that. No, I think it's I you know, it's weird. I, I never really thought of it until you just said it. But I actually really agree with the sort of YouTube putting less of an inherent pressure on people. Like I definitely think like Instagram, which I don't even do, like I don't run the TFD Instagram. I have my own, which is like much smaller. But that has been way worse for my mental health than YouTube has been. Yeah. Like I feel like YouTube allows breathing room in terms of like you can be nuanced on a subject. You can speak on something at length. You can take time between things. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a more healthy place. I mean. Surprisingly. <laughs> surprisingly. And I'm sure not for everyone. I mean a, a surprising number of YouTubers have been like canceled in horrible circumstances. So like not for everyone clearly. Um. Okay. <clears throat> what is your budget around fashion spending and how did you choose the amount? Um. I don't actually have – budget tisk tisk mina no i know i know but okay the i i definitely say that i i live below my means and i think that is like the most important thing <laughs> at the end of the day um i just like i i know that fashion is one of those things that i love to indulge in and i have a budget in the sense that there's like a cap to how much i will spend on a certain garment i generally will not spend over 250 <laughs> on on a piece unless it's for a really special occasion or it's like you know a birthday event like something like really crazy that I'm like okay I'm gonna like indulge in this um and I think usually that ends up working out for me because secondhand mm-hmm. everything tends to be cheaper I've gotten some pretty nice designer uh shoes that usually go for like 700 retail for a really low price i'll wait for things to go on sale um but sadly no budget no budget wow we're in a stage of intervention before you leave 
So, okay, you already touched on them a little bit, but we did get several questions specifically about Reformation. Um, <laughs> so this person says, I wanted to talk about, quote, ethical, trendy fashion. I'm looking at you, Reformation. It's ironic how trendy summer dresses are touted as investment pieces now, but then they go out of fashion within a year. Also hard to justify the cost per wear of a $250 dress uh, for a $250 tiny dress. Uh, yet the cult following remains unbelievable. Discuss. <laughs> Uh, wait, the, the cult for summer dresses or the cult for reformation? Reformation, I think. But also, you know, summer dresses that are like inconvenient to wear in most circumstances, probably. I mean, I think I, I just don't listen to any of those like fashion blogs or, you know, people who are like trend forecasters because, yeah, then you run into issues where it's like, oh, the summer dress is supposed to be an investment piece but I don't like wearing them right. um, so I think it's more important to consider what you feel comfortable in and that will depend also on your personal body type um, for instance like I don't like a lot of summer dresses because I feel like the 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 gap here is like they leave a lot of room for cleavage that I don't have and it always like fits me in a weird way and then if I'm like if it's a windy day then I'll just like whoop and I'll have like a nip slip <laughs> so I, summer dresses are not a staple for me um so I think just like knowing truly what you feel comfortable in and that's like always going to be a journey depending um on where you are in terms of like fashion experimentation but yeah don't listen to anyone don't listen to anyone else I had my first real, I mean, I'm sure I've had others, but my first real like identifiable, mo identifiable moment of like not for me uh, last year when I was like the nap dress is everywhere and like every Wait, woman. what is the nap dress? The nap dress. <laughs> I, like every woman in my life bought one. It's like, it's just like a kind of like, it's often like an empire waist, like a, like a linen-y, cotton-y with like big, often puffy sleeves, kind of romantic. It looks kind of like a nighty from the 1800s a little okay, bit. Okay, Yeah. And I was just like, it was everywhere in my life, on my internet, like in media. And I was like, not for me. No thanks. Yeah. And I didn't buy one and it felt good. Yeah. Th nothing trendy ever has to be for you, you exactly. know, just because everyone else is wearing it. And to go back to the summer dress uh, scenario, I went to a wedding last year and I don't think I got the dress code because everyone who went wore a summer dress it was like a reception um and I was like oh my god I definitely like do not I do not belong here in that sense but I was wearing um I believe a skull cap and a harness <laughs> what <laughs> no sorry um it's, it doesn't sound like as risque as it's as it sounds as I say it, it's like a one of those like I have a picture on Instagram. We'll it's put up not, the picture right, and it's, you we'll let you judge. decide. <laughs> right. Like, um, and uh, there were a couple of people who were like, oh, you look really good. And I was like, thank you. Um, and I felt good in that moment. I was like, OK, I'm not following what everyone else has done. But as long as it's not like offensive to the party, which I don't think it was, then, yeah, I'm just going to live my truth. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> okay, so I think the most expensive clothing item or accessory you own is probably your Regency dress. Yes, okay. that is correct. <laughs> Nine, uh, 950. Um, okay, so uh, last two things from, you know, that generally people are talking about. So one is that, so I'm 33, you're 25. So we do, I think, belong to different generations. And we also, I think, uh, have a very different experience of the internet and especially the social internet. Do you feel like Gen Z is... Uh, worse off than previous generations as as far as how um, social consumption is affecting these choices for them? Um, yes. But I think it's definitely complicated because I think at the same time for millennials, we didn't really have – I I consider myself a millennial. I know you're like, uh. <laughs> Wait, is, when is the cutoff for millennial? It's, it's 1996, which is the year I was born. So oh. I'm technically, I guess, a Ooh. cuspy, but – I don't know. I, I don't know. I was like reading the New York Times when I was in high school and they'd always complain about millennials and I just like felt like I was part of this group that people were you complaining about. You were reading about. the New York Times in high school. So chic. <laughs> That's what happens when you grow outside of D.C. Um, but yeah, so I, um, I think back for millennials, you know, there's kind of like one, one prominent discourse that was like, fed to us 
and I didn't know what was problematic back then because I just like followed like the New York Times and then you know, um, Tiger Beat, for instance. Like I had just like only a few sources dictating what my life philosophy was going to be, like what my perspective was going to be. And I think the beauty of social media now is that you have a ton of different voices um, that are cropping up and people talking about a lot of topics that wouldn't get so much press um, back in the day because they were too controversial or something. Um, So, you know, just like looking at uh, trans issues, for instance, and I have a younger brother who is... 18 I always I always fumble this and he always fact check he always gives me so much uh yeah he is I think he is 18 and um I remember when I would talk about him when he was in high school and he was like yeah there's like a couple kids at my school who are non-binary I would not have known any kids at my high school who were non-binary like that was not even in our lexicon back at my high school so I think that's one of those things that is really good about growing up today where it's um, I would say society is a lot more tolerant than it used to be. But on the flip side, your brain is like controlled by Mark Zuckerberg in a certain in a certain sense. And I I do get sad seeing these little kids like playing with iPads at, you know, any any time their parents like don't want to hang out with them instead of like them running around. And I actually I read this book recently called Stolen Focus, which I highly mm. recommend. It's about how these tech companies, Johan Hari. I love his books. I thought it was his book. I'm a huge fan of his books. Okay. Continue, sorry. Um, yeah, no, it was a really good book. It was a really enlightening read about how technology is uh, controlling us. Or, you know, a lot of tech companies just like uh, try their best to monopolize our attention and all these repercussions for society. But he mentions how... Um, Back in the day, like, kids would run around all the time, like, outside. And nowadays, like, there's, like, this whole crop of parents who are just very, we can't have our kids, like, going out um, and doing things and being, like, independent people. There's a lot more helicopter parents. Mm. And I think that is a crutch to the newer generation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I have such vivid memories growing up of my mother literally locking the door and saying, like, I don't care what you do. You just do not come back into the house until dinner time. Like, go yeah. out and play. It, it was like summer. She was she's a teacher. So she was home. She was like, I'm sick of you kids. Like, get out of here. Like, go play. like go hit each other with rocks outside. I don't care. Yeah. My mom was so vigilant about my TV time. Mm-hmm. And she was like, if she thought I was watching too much TV, she would just like turn it off and be like, go outside. Like, don't come, don't come until dinner time. Exactly that. And yeah, it's, it's disheartening to know that so many kids are just like on the internet all the time and not even because, you know, they're like actively trying to. It's just because like they don't really have other pathways. Totally. And it's interesting how I'm sure like for a lot of parents, like leaving a child unsupervised outside could feel dangerous, but we don't, I think, I think we're starting to now, but I don't think we yet register how dangerous it can be for children to be on the internet all the time. Oh, for sure. (laughs) I don't know. I was probably like talking to a child predator online in high school and I had no idea. (laughs) I was, listen, I was on AOL Instant Messenger, ASL. I mean, (laughs) talking to all kinds of who knows what. Um, Okay, so the last question before we get into our very quick rapid fire. Um, So you mentioned being a Disney adult and I know uh, we recently did a video on that phenomenon on as well as Disneyland um much to much to unpack there um I'm curious you you seem to have a much more sort of like not stan not fandom relationship toward the things you love now and sort of intentionally so um can you talk a little bit about your transition from being part of such a specific fandom to taking a more critical eye towards the things that you love it was actually um, when I did the Disney College program. Which you did? Is- oh, my God. Stop the <laughs> you the Digi- Oh, my gosh. You did? I Oh, I thought you just said you were a big Disney fan. I didn't hear the college program. Please continue. No, it was um, – and it's kind of ironic because I feel like the Disney College program is where they, like, you know, uh, really indoctrinate you. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I don't know. It was a very fun time in my life for sure. 
but I did it the summer of 2016. Um, and I went to school in Canada. I went to McGill University. So Good for you. Harvard of the North. OK. <laughs> so um, because of that, like I was technically an international student, even though right. I was American. And so my program was for the summer months. Um, I know that for American colleges, you do like a semester. But it worked out for me because I didn't have to take off school to do it. And it was very fun. But I... <laughs> so I had a lot of these friends from Disney and um, when I left Disney World that was kind of like my moment when I had all these reflections and I was really thinking about my time there and it was really it really clarified some things for me when one of my friends friends from Disney uh, came out as like a staunch Trump supporter <laughs> Oh, no. Uh, leading up to the election. And I was like, oh, my God. And I was like, I really don't know any of these people. Like, we all just bonded over the fact that we love Disney and that's all we talked about. But I don't know anything about these people at all. And um, I don't know. It just, like, it really put me in this, like, weird spiral where I was, like, analyzing the social media usage of, like, my fellow Mouseketeers post-Disney uh, college program. And I'm like, okay, I don't agree with this person. I don't, like, really like what this person is saying. And um, I just started getting annoyed by the way that they all seem to, like, idolize this time. And it just, like, I was becoming very contrarian about the whole thing. And I was like, was it really that nice of a time? Like, I was working six hours in stroller parking in, like, the Florida heat. I was yelled at by my manager on, like, multiple occasions for just, like, really mundane stuff. It was basically, like, um, they call it the Disney College Program, but there's nothing academic about it. Like, right. you're, working, you're working a job, like, as uh, someone who works the park, but you're paid less than everyone working full and part-time. And they have Disney housing that you're forced to live in to be a part of the college program. And they take out rent payments from your check, even though they own the properties. So wow. there are all these things that I was just thinking about. And I was like, oh, my God, like I just provided like <laughs> minimum wage labor for Disney. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. I just... Uh, I still love Disney movies for sure. I They always have like this nostalgic place in my heart. But Disney as a company, we're in. We've got beef. <laughs> We've got beef now. It's giving Scientology like Sea Org vibes where <laughs> just like go work on a boat and be really grateful for it. Um, yeah, we had to smile like constantly. Um, that's healthy. And it was, <laughs> it was one of those things where it's like afterwards um, – I was like, I can't believe like I put myself through that. Yeah. But even though while I was doing it, I had the time of my life. And that was definitely like interesting for me to to realize. Uh, favorite Disney movie? Mulan. Uh, okay. Did, are we including Pixar? Yes. Ratatouille. <laughs> Adorable. Unexpected. I'm surprised it's not <laughs> classic Disney given your overall vintage vibe. I know, but it's just like uh, the reason I love Ratatouille is one, I have an extreme phobia of rats. <laughs> I know, and I live here, but I if I see a rat cross my path, I scream like I saw a dead person. And this has always been in my life. I have no idea when this rat phobia started. Uh-oh. Um, and I was afraid of rats when I saw Ratatouille. But uh, I don't know. Like there was something about it. It like changed my perspective for like an hour and 30 minutes. <laughs> it was a magical moment. I did cry at Ratatouille. I did when he was eating that dish, well, the Ratatouille, and he was going back to his childhood. And I was also 10 when that came out, so technically I was still a child. I was also 10 when that came out. <laughs> so the time has come, everyone. Um, loyal listeners will know what time it is, but for those who don't, it is time for our rapid fire questions. We ask these to our guests. Now you can feel free to pass um, or, you know, get clarification, but the point is them to just, the point is just to answer them as it comes to your head. No right or wrong answers. Mm. Um, what is the big financial secret of your industry? And we'll say the fashion industry. Uh, big designers do not pay well. Ooh, pay well for like? For designers. Okay. Like you would make more money working for Zara or H&M as a designer. It doesn't shock me given like the Condé Nast, like for me, like being in media, like the people I've known who worked at Condé Nast have been like some of the lowest paid people I've known in yeah. the industry. Though I heard they just instituted a, a pay floor. Is that right? So I, I believe they just unionized 
as of like a week ago. Good and so them. they're I, they're probably in negotiations. Good for them. Our fun fact, uh, some may even know this TFD lore. Uh, our editor prior to Holly was a woman who, before working at TFD, was an assistant editor at The New Yorker who was making $27,000 a year. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> She quit to work at Murray's Cheese Shop, where she made substantially more and got health insurance. So oh, my God. She wrote an article about it. It's on TFD. Um, okay. What do you invest in versus what are you cheap about? Um, I invest in accommodations, like for traveling. Mm. I am cheap about food. <laughs> Out of curiosity, where did you stay when you went to D.C. or just with your family, I guess? I just stayed with my family. Okay. So, so I was like, ooh, give me the hot, luxurious <laughs> hotel racks in D.C. Okay. Um, what has been your best investment and why? Oh my God. I don't, um, college. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't do an ROI on the spot, but I bet it's probably your YouTube channel. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> screw you college. Like, screw college. <laughs> <laughs> it's a YouTube channel. It definitely wasn't the Disney college program. Yeah, definitely not Disney university. <laughs> oh my God. It's so scary. Um, okay. What has been your biggest money mistake and why? Um, honestly, all the things that I bought before uh, figuring out my personal style. <laughs> oh my gosh. What was like, was there like a specific aesthetic you were going for? Um, I was like very much in the e-girl phase back in like 2017. I had like a lot of like uh, leather, grommet belts, um, hardware like type of stuff. And, you know, in a way I don't regret it, but cumulatively I think I spent more money than I would have liked to if it was just going to be an experiential experimental phase i'm picturing grimes <laughs> um what is your biggest current money insecurity oh um where i'll be in the future <laughs> does that count <laughs> yeah fair enough uh do you mean like geographically no um i mean like how much money I'll have in the future. Because, you know, with YouTube, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, you could rise fast, but you could fall just as fast. And um, I'm really bad with, like, investment type of stuff. So, uh, yeah, just um, a financial insecurity is being financially insecure. <laughs> well, listen, you mentioned not having a budget for I clothing know, spending. I Nothing know. will help you more for financial planning than having a budget. We we'll need to chat after this is over. Yes. <laughs> uh, this is like a, yeah, it's a church. Everyone comes and converts to being, you know, financially solvent. Okay. What has been the financial habit that has helped you the most? Um, I, I honestly, I don't, having an accountant, does that I mean, count? Okay. That's probably, I mean, I'm sure your taxes are a mess being a YouTube yeah, creator. Yeah, my so. taxes are absolutely a mess. So thank you, Brian. <laughs> Brian. <laughs> Let's hear it. Let's get a going in the chat. Uh, but also, I mean, for, for what it's worth, like if you're if you have complicated taxes, investing in an accountant is almost always like an, you'll see an immediate return in what you are able to save in your taxes because the person preparing them understands how to properly deduct and all of mm -hmm. that. Um, OK, last question is, when did you first feel successful and what does that word mean to you? Um, I first felt successful when I moved out of <laughs> my parents' house. <laughs> Ooh, that's a great one. We, um, I don't think we've ever gotten that one before, but it's good. I think success is, for me, is just being financially independent um, because there are so many times in my life where I just, like, was insecure financially and it just manifested in terrible, terrible ways. Like, I was codependent in my relationships. I was extremely uh, – I had like more of a toxic relationship with my own parents and just having like my own stuff sorted out has made me just a better person <laughs> overall. I love it. Um, well, it's obviously been such a pleasure for us, but for our audience who wants to go find uh, even more about you and what you do, where should they go? Um, Mina Lai is the, is the most... <laughs> Mina Lay is the best place to find me on YouTube. I also go by Gremlita, uh, G-R-E-M-L-I-T-A, on basically all other socials. So I love it. Um, well, thank you guys so much for tuning in. And we will see you back here next Monday for an all-new episode of The Financial Confessions. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>